Hello, guys. Welcome to another episode of Bikini and the Brain. I am here with my lovely co host, Ashley Cotwell, sir. <laughs> Hello, everybody. I love that intro. It's the best. Do you like it? Yeah. yeah. What's yours? Mine? Um, what, what sound describes you? Uh, probably this one. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> we all know the people are here to see you. Come yes, on. Yes, because I and got mad dad jokes. That's what Yeah, I, and the best shirts in town. You like it? Yeah. I, this that's one my says, thing. ask me about my podcast. Yes. I'm hoping that someone does. Let's hope. I, I mean, maybe if you leave this gym area, <laughs> <and> where <laughs> it, they might ask you. I'm hoping that someone besides both of our parents will uh, listen to the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hope. My mom's my only fan. I'm like, sweet. I got a view. I can turn one it off now. View. Mom. Thanks, mom. <laughs> 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 Bob and Kimber, that's it. All right. So, what do we got today? What's on the docket? You know, I thought um, I thought we should discuss a frustrating thing that happens to a lot of competitors. Um, why they're not seeing progress? Maybe they're not able to push through a plateau. And there's a lot of reasons why this is happening. Um, whether they're aware of the things they do are affecting it or not, I think it's important to go over because you know this is like this is like we're in the we're in like the middle of competition season. This is when all the shows are happening. A lot of shows. <laughs> there was three last weekend. Crazy um, last weekend. Yeah. So I think this is a, a perfect time to kind of reevaluate why some competitors aren't seeing the progress that they'd like to see. Yeah, for sure. And you know what, Ashley, we should go into your last weekend too before we jump into the podcast. Oh. We both had rough weekends. Yeah. Go ahead. What happened? Oh, well, okay. I shouldn't complain. So I had, uh, <laughs> I was, um, I was in Phoenix, Arizona for a NS, NASM photo shoot um, and video shoot for their new bodybuilding guide thing, which was kind of cool. I felt like, a, cool. I felt like a real fitness model or something like, okay, I'm, I'm not an Instagram model anymore. I'm a, <laughs> I'm a real fitness model, but it was like a big mm. production and um, they had a lot of crew on set. They had a person that was just for styling, just for this, that, and holding the the what is it the boom mic thing yeah it was like it was like an la production or something um but really long days it was like 7 a.m to 7 p.m but um i I, that wasn't too bad uh but what was bad is just like for such a short flight which is like a 50 minute flight oh my gosh flights were delayed canceled i was like i spent like 40 hours at an airport i was sleeping like four hours a night since friday and even last night, four hours. Which it was rough to get up this morning. Yeah, and we can go into that with plateaus and stuff today too. You know, yeah, people it's aren't probably, getting results. Yeah, probably part of it. It, it makes a <laughs> makes a difference. It does. It yeah. does. And why was your? I wasn't work? rough. I just I didn't sleep much because well, one, um, I was supposed to go to Missouri with Kimber, right, and be at the. She's she's from a small town. She lives on a farm. I was supposed to go there and meet her parents, all that. But I didn't go because we had so many competitions. Everyone jumped into the competitions, but everyone jumped in Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Oh, so, yeah, that's right. So it was like, it was there was like no breaks, you know, no breaks and at there's all. there's no week. internet around there, yeah? Or yeah. Or the internet's rough. You have to like, well, just depend. We just weren't sure how it would be, and you just can't not do check-ins. Right, it'd be like, like hey, why isn't my coach texting me back? <laughs> do I look that bad to where he's he doesn't even want to? acknowledge my existence when I check in <laughs> what's going on yeah, so it just like worked out yeah it just worked out that way where there was a Friday pro show Saturday pro show Sunday pro show so I'm up like you know through the first check-in is like when they do their hair and makeup or whatever so it's like 4 a.m depending on where they're at like 4 a.m 5 a.m like Friday Saturday Sunday so usually it's pretty usually there's not much to do the day of the show I think that's important too for people to know like the day of the show there's really not much you should you're gonna do the, a lot of times people freak out. They're like, well, is my coach going to be there? My coach not going to be there? And I'm like, really, they don't do that much the day of the show. Like, it, you should, everything should be done at that point. Like, you shouldn't. Haze in the barn. Yeah. I mean, we're talking five hours before the show starts. There's not any significant difference of what's going to happen. You, you know, sometimes when the show is like later in the day, like way later in the day, I mean, you get to look, manage water a little bit better. You know, you can't like just not drink water for 12 hours and expect to be your best on stage. But the rest of the time, I mean, it should be pretty much done. I think the most important day is really like if it's a Saturday show, usually Thursday is the most important day. That's like the final day to load. And Friday, we keep it tight. Try to keep that waistline super tight. Saturday, I mean, if the show's early enough, sometimes they're not eating anything. Like if it's like a 9 a.m., 8.30 show, I'm like, just just go on stage, yeah. you know, that type of thing. I, so, I usually fast as well, like if it's an early, early yeah. event. Maybe I'll have like something super small, like maybe some sunflower seed butter and that's it. Yeah, it's just to keep me... From like, yeah, keep you from like, you know, lightheaded and whatnot. But yeah, so anyway, so for you guys out there that are always worried about that, that's a that's a big question. I think people think 
the day of the show is going to make this huge like, difference. And I'm like, like the, like the difference between first place and 10th place would be like one rice cake. Yeah. What if that was it? What if it was that, <laughs> that intense? Like, Oh man, if I just would have ate that one extra rice cake, I could have yeah. won the show. And you know what you know what I'll get to a lot of, and I don't get it so much from my people because I kind of set them up for it. Yeah. But I get it from a lot of other people. So coaches out there, tell your athletes this, because this is a thing and athletes, you should listen to this because the next day after a show, um, if a girl doesn't, it's only if they don't win, though. It's never if they win. But if a girl doesn't win, um, like they can get anywhere between second and 20th place, right? But they're still going to be, they're still going to say this. They're going to be, oh, I, you know, I was just flat and then I went out and I had a burger and I had this. And then the next day I was so much better. I was so much, I should have just done oh. that. They always say that. I'm like, look, okay, here's the deal. When you go on stage, you're never going to be like 100% full. Like if you're, if you're 100% full, it's only because you were shredded and it was okay to fill and spill. So there's this thing I do called fill and spill where I'll get, like if it's, if it's a smaller girl and they need to have like every gram of muscle loaded with glycogen, I'll get them a little too lean. That way I can just load them with carbs like that last week. But that's if they're too small and I'm not worried about them spilling over, right? And I'll just fill and spill, fill and spill, you know, and just get them a little too lean that week and then just feed them like crazy. No car to just feed them. But um, that's the only time you're really going to be 100% full. Usually you're sacrificing a tiny bit of fullness for that conditioning. That's usually mm -hmm. the trade, you know? And right. um, and I, and so just so you know, like the next day after the show, especially because your stress is lower too and you're going to have lower water retention, you're usually going to think to yourself, oh, I'm better. A lot of times you're paying for it on the waistline though and you're a little more blurry, but you're fuller. Yeah, that's going to be a that's going to be like 99% of the time. Usually you're going to be fuller the next day because you've eaten a bunch more, but you're usually softer, but you don't, you won't see that the next day, you know? Right. And sometimes you get a little harder, but a lot of times it's because of stress. Like you're just right. not thinking about the show too. And you're just not holding any water at all. You totally. Know? And also to keep in mind, it's like, well, me, even if you did look better, like the chances of that happening versus playing it safe, I wouldn't, I wouldn't take those odds. I wouldn't risk it. Like maybe there's like a 5% chance like I would look better if I just had a burger and fries the night before the show. Um, just like you, know, it doesn't usually work like yeah. that. I mean, sometimes very rarely it does, but me, I'm, I'm a little more like, oh, conservative <laughs> in that aspect. I'll, I'll, I'd rather look 95% and play it safe than risk, you know, doing something crazy like that and then just looking even worse. Yeah. And the value of replicating it is huge too. Yeah. Because if we find something that works perfectly, we're like, whoa, that's it. We'll use that. Like, you know, it's, it's never going to be that easy where you just do the same thing over and over again, but at least you have a baseline, you know, yeah. the problem with the burger and, and a fries thing too, is that depending on what city you're at and what's available, it's going to be a huge variance in how many fries they gave you, how, how much oil is in those fries, the thickness of the fries going to have a difference of how much oil is absorbed in them. Uh, how big is the meat? How much salt did they put on it? Like, it's like a whole, how big is the bun? There's like all these huge variances that are going to be, it's going to be hard to replicate, you know? So, um, so I'm, a, I'm a fan of just keeping it simple, collecting data. Um, but I just, for, so, so you guys are out there and you, maybe if your coach isn't going to be there, you have a, a online coach, you know, that's what we do too. Um, and they're not there. Just understand there is not that much that's going to happen the day of the show. Um, in terms of like the coach, like more often than not, when I'm backstage with like Ashley, we'll do, a, we'll do a pump, which you can do on your own. And I'll look at her hair and make sure her suit's <laughs> tied. <laughs> like I've gotten, I'm like, well, I'm going to be useful in some capacity. So I need to do something here. So I like started getting really good at doing hair. Yeah, <laughs> I've been backstage go. cutting hair before at one I time, saw you. you know, I've, I've gotten my skill sets pretty high, but it, I, 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 I stopped it because it started turning into a thing. <laughs> so I was like, okay, no more, no more Adam hairstylist. But, but, um, anyway, so yeah, that was, that was the weekends, but I had still got a good time. Everyone had really good showings, two pro debuts. They both, they both did pretty good. Um, I was really happy with how they looked their pro debut. Heck yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, Anya did good. She got a first call out at, um, in, Go in Texas. Woo. Yeah. So that was good. Um, but yeah, and that's another example too, of like stresses and whatnot too, and how that can make a difference. Um, cause she stresses before shows and she'll, you know, she talked about it on her podcast and stuff too. Gets a little bit like anxious going into shows and she gets a tiny bit watery like that day. And it's like, you know, I think just the more experience that someone has, the, the less stress they're going to have, the less water retention they're going to have, things like that. Um, but I also, I wanted to talk about that because it goes into the reason why people aren't, one of the reasons why people aren't getting results that like we talked about. And one of them is, you know, stress and sleep. Yeah. A huge one. I often ponder how much better I would be if I could sleep. Well, you know, but disclaimer because I, I people like to be helpful you know and believe me i've tried it all yeah 
It's she so really funny. Has. Like, listen, because I'll get, I'll get phase. messages. I'll get messages like, "Have you, have you tried melatonin?" And I'd be like, <laughs> "No, what is mel- melatonin? <laughs> I, what is this substance? I have never heard of." This. <laughs> like what four is, years ago, what is that. this melatonin <laughs> you speak of? No, believe me, I've tried it. Literally, I've tried literally it all. all of it. And the thing is, you know, some of these things are helpful to 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 help you fall asleep. For me, um, but. I can't stay asleep. So I don't really have issues falling asleep. Like I'm not one. I, I mean, I can't really take naps. So I'm, I don't fall asleep like that easily. And I can't fall asleep sitting up, but I can fall asleep nine or 10. That's fine. But staying asleep, that's tough. That is tough. Yeah. I wake up at like two or three a.m. without an alarm. And I wake up with so much energy, like whew, I'm ready to go. <laughs> like almost like I had a shot of pre-workout in my dreams or something. Like I just took my shaker of pre-workout in my dreams and just chugged it. And then I wake up with like, whoa, I'm ready to get the day started. And then I like crash at noon. But I woke up once you were at my house in Denver and I woke up once and I had all these messages. I had like I had like three messages from people at the gym, like at 24 Hour Fitness. They were like, like, hey, um, I saw Ashley at the gym this morning. Uh, she's in town or whatever. Right. And I was like, she's like, I was like, one girl was like, yeah, I wanted to say hi, but she was working out. And I'm like, it's 730. What do you mean you saw her at the church? Oh, she's, no, it was like four. No, no. When I oh, woke oh, up, oh. <laughs> I was like, it's 730. What do you mean you saw her? She's at the house. Yeah. She's like, yeah, she was there. And I'm like, and I went downstairs. I was like, I was like, Ashley, have you worked out already? And she, and she was like, yeah, I just had so much energy. She's like, but I'm still going to work out later. Don't worry. <laughs> I was like, what? Yeah. Like, you've done your workout, your cardio, like already eaten two meals. I'm like, I'm just waking up. This is so funny. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, true. I mean, it has gotten a little bit better that I'm not like actively competing like every other weekend or whatever. A little bit, but still 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 wake up really early and then last weekend the reason why I only slept four hours per night was because of the shooting schedule and all the flight delays and cancellations so yeah so hopefully hopefully across my fingers I can get some sleep tonight yeah but yeah that that is back to the point that is a big factor it of is. weight loss you know your body's trying to recover when you sleep you know um that's, I guess, when you do your most recovery, true or false. Yeah, I mean, your your best recovery is then, you know, during during that time. Um, I think that you're, if, you're, if you're not sleeping a lot, your cortisol levels are raised, you know, mm-hmm. it throws you off a little bit hormonally. It makes things a little bit harder, you know. Digestion, and, too. It's like yeah. your body doesn't have time to digest it. And so what, what I've found as a coach, you know, because a lot of times people will run into these plateaus. It's plateaus are, everyone's going to run into a plateau. And one of the things I think people need to understand your, your fat loss journey when you're in prep, it's never going to be linear. It's yeah. never going to be this linear approach where, you know, my goal for um, someone is to lose 1% of their weight. So if you're 200 pounds, I'm trying to lose two pounds. If you're Ashley's weight, she's 125 pounds, I'm trying to her to lose 1.25 pounds a week, right? So it varies based on the person too. So if you're five foot tall and you're 100 pounds, like don't get mad that you're not losing two pounds per week because that's what I'm asking 200 pound people to do, you know, you're going to lose one pound and you should be happy with that. That's 1% of your weight. So uh, people look at the wrong numbers, you know, they look at percentages, not your total number. But, um, where I was going with that too, is that I'll have, when I see people stop getting results or slow down, one of the things I always want to ask is, okay, we're doing, are we doing it? One, I'll look at my stuff. Am I doing everything right? Did I take the right approach? Did I make micro progressions to this point? Why am I stuck? How long have I been in these micro progressions? Have I been doing it too long? Does she need a deload? Like, have I done my part, right? I'll look at that part first. Okay, there, I've done my part. So I'll go look. Okay, I did my part. My part's right. I look at it, look back at it. And I'm like, okay, I did that right. Okay, there's nothing I messed up. Next thing. Okay, where is she at hormonally? Have we tested her hormonally? Is her estrogen really high? Is her testosterone really low? Have we done those tests yet? Okay, if you haven't and we're stuck, let's figure that out. We'll send her to our, our doctor and our doctor will run their labs on them and just make sure uh, that their their hormones and all that internally are right. Thyroid, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, and sometimes even checking their na- their growth hormones. And we're talking about, these are natural people. We're just talking about their natural levels of production, right? So we, okay, we eliminate that now. So that's good. The progression's good. What else is happening? What's going on in your life? And then you, you talk to them and they're like, oh, like it might be a girl. And she's like, oh, I'm going through a really stressful time, whatever, a bad breakup, a different job, lost a job, whatever, not sleeping that much. And you're like, oh, that's, that's it. Right. And it, it sounds weird because if everything's lined up, how would that affect things? You know, and I don't know the, the science of why it doesn't, but what I can say is that I have seen this happen with high stress positions all the time. So, um, one of the most, like eye opening ones was when I is, is still when I work with CPA. So if you guys know CPA is an accountant, they do taxes, all that stuff. Come March time, April time, when these people have to file all their taxes in the U S like to like finish it, 
almost always their, their, their progress stops in March and April. And it's not that they're not working out still, it's that they're working so many more hours than they're used to to try to get these taxes done for all their people during before the deadline that they're so stressed that the results just like freeze up. And it's so crazy. And then when that date hits, when April 16th hits, I think it's April 15th is a cutoff, like that week, all of a sudden, boom, results. And I'm like, what just happened? Like you just, huge results. And it's just like their body was like, <sighs> Yeah. I wonder if it's a stress or they're putting most of their focus and energy on their work. Like for example, if you've got so many um, tasks to do for work, you're probably not going to have a free mind to kind of concentrate on your lifts. So that's where the intensity comes in, right? With your cardio and your lifts. Like let's say you were doing the same amount of cardio and lifting the same as you were and then you stop seeing results and some life event like that happened or the work got crazy. You're kind of shifting your focus onto that. Although it's like your mental energy still, I do believe it translates because you can't focus and have like a motivated mindset. I mean, you know, the feeling of like having check-ins waiting for you when you're trying to work out and it's kind of like, Oh, I I gotta do this. I gotta do this. I mean, I gotta do cardio. Yes. I'm still going through the motions, but maybe you're not really using that mind to muscle connection when you're lifting and maybe not doing, um, all you should be, but not realizing it. Right. You could think that you are, but maybe deep down you're too distracted by what's going on and you're not giving it your all. Yeah. Um, I'm sure there's by a, accident. Yeah. I would love to know. I would love for them to figure that out and know like the percentages of focus and intensity and stress and how those things all factor in. Cause that's going to be a, that would be really interesting to see. I don't even know how they would do that, but I definitely agree with that. Um, you know, when I'm, when I'm uh, like a high stress day or there's like a lot going on that day, like my workouts tend to suck, yeah. you know, and I'm like, uh, I don't know why I'm here. You know, I'm just going to go and get my check-ins in and then I can, then I'm just like free, you know? Or if I'm listening to good music versus like uh, a podcast about something else, like I do better in the gym lifting weights. I do better on cardio listening to like a podcast or something. I do better lifting weights, just music, like anything that takes away from my concentration of, of weights, like listening, like like in-depth listening of like whatever might be going on in the world versus music then I'm like, I'm way better at working out. So there's mm-hmm. a, that's definitely a factor in it, I think. Yeah. yeah. And I think too, like the lack of sleep could also kind of correlate with that as well. See, when you're not getting good sleep, you're probably not in the best mood and you might not get the best lifts because I don't know about you, but I tend to have much better lifts and cardio sessions when I'm in a really good mood. I'm happy. I'm super motivated. I always say like sometimes motivation is the best pre-workout, right? You can caffeinate yourself all you want, but if you're not motivated that day for whatever reason, maybe a distraction, maybe lack of sleep, then you might not have the best workouts, you know? Yeah. Just it's it's incredible like how much more intensity I put into my workouts when I'm in such a good mood. I'm like, yeah, I can do anything because it. whenever you're in, in a good mood, like it feels like the heavy weights aren't as heavy. It feels like the cardio isn't as long as it is. Even though you are putting in a lot of effort, it's almost like it's more like – I, I don't know, easier, yeah. you know, it's, it's just, it doesn't seem as hard as it is. Whereas when you're in a bad mood and you're grumpy and you're stressed, everything seems much harder than it is. Like even, even if your workouts aren't uh, changing, it might be like, oh man, this is just not a good mood. This workout sucks. Like I'm just over it. Yeah. I'm just whatever, you know, I hate those workouts. And then you're kind of like, why am I even here? To yeah. Work why am I start... here? I'm just going through the motions. Yeah. yeah. And then you get in your head and your workouts even worse. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I've yeah. done that. So you guys, uh, I have a couple people that asked here uh, if they can ask a question, go ahead and ask a question. And I have another question. Oh, and also someone says your shoulders are looking good. Deanne, really? Deanne oh, said your shoulders are looking popping. Dion, Dion, oh, come <laughs> Dion, you're going to make my shoulder blush. Look, I got, I got goosebumps on my shoulder. That's like my, <laughs> my shoulder blushing. That's like the equivalent of a, a blush for the shoulder. <laughs> Deanne, but, Deanne, yeah. we just did Masters Nationals together. She was one spot away from her pro card. She got second. Aww. I know. It's Next time. Yeah, you're so close. And so she's going to keep going, but it's North uh, American. No, she didn't go to North Americans. Um, well, she had a vacation. Yet. She had a vacation plan with her daughter. Oh, and okay, so that's okay. Why. But next year, she'll get it next year. But that second place, man, I, 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 I almost like. I'm sorry, Dean, but I almost want third instead of second, like because second's like, oh, we couldn't. Like it was just like one point. It's you in know? reach. It's like oh, three times it happened at Masters Nationals this year. We have three second places. We we got a pro card too, but three seconds, and I'm like, literally. It's just one thing different could have been done different for, for that. Oh, you know. I hate that feeling. Now, last year we had four pro cards. I thought we had five this year. I made a bet I made a bet with my buddy that we'd have five. We had some really good girls there, but we didn't get five this year. 
So we're, we're both set on this breaking four. We both have done four multiple times. We haven't done five. Okay. Like actual people. So well, we there's have still more national shows left, so we we'll have, see. Yeah, we have a bet going, an ongoing okay. bet. It's been, it's been a little while. It's hard. <laughs> it's oh, it is. It's harder every year. Super hard. Five is like, five is hard. Um, Especially because we're both not like huge, you know, we're both pretty like mm-hmm. smaller. So anyway, uh, one of the questions Size, came in. Size, like in, in numbers. Of yeah, how many people we have. Okay, because yeah. we're not talking about like. Yeah, like we're both like, we're, we're both 4'8", and we don't have that, so we're not going to get as many pro okay. cards. <laughs> just to clarify, you know yeah. how people are online, yeah. they just don't make the connection sometimes. Yeah, the, um, so one of the questions was, how much sleep is ideal? From what I've read, seven to nine hours is the most ideal time frame, so. However, there is this one. <laughs> Can you go? Yeah, go ahead, Ashley. <laughs> okay, J- Ashley is like she tries to find research I'm, to justify her lack I of sleep. She's I'm like, I think I'm just one of these people. <laughs> I'm trying to rationalize. So apparently, there is this one gene that a few people possess um, that um, they don't require as much sleep, and I'm hoping I have it <laughs> and they can still function. I don't know. I honestly, I just saw it. I just saw it in a documentary once, but I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how true it is, to be honest. I'm just using that as an excuse. And, and you know, ignorance is bliss. Maybe I just don't research it more than I should. But <laughs> I just I just want to convince myself, okay? <laughs> <laughs> okay, here's another question we got. Do you have any tips for training success for when a girl is on her period? Do you adjust carbs or anything? Oh, no, no, not really. I'm sorry I didn't read that question. <laughs> uh, no, honestly, no. Just get through the week. Uh, you're going to hold water. Most, most girls will hold water. And then I would say just get through the week. Um, it does throw off your check-ins. That's the only hard part about it. So like when we're coaching and someone has like huge water fluctuate, I have one client that gains five pounds every time she's on her period. Jeez. It's a lot. Yeah. So that week, we lose that week of data like every week. It's basically, hey, keep it the same this week. Let's see what happens next week. Because I mean, it's like, there's just the data so far off. The waistline's bloated. The weight gain is crazy. So it's like, how do you use that data? And you just hope it doesn't happen the week of your show. You know what I mean? So I just say get through that week. And another question, Ashley, do you have a boyfriend? She does. And he's awesome, dude. I do. Dude. I do. He's kind of camera shy, so you don't hear much of him. But yeah. He's super hot. <laughs> <laughs> he is. He's a, like one of the best looking guys I've ever yeah. met in my life. I, I like the pretty ones, you know. He's super pretty. Yeah. He's like, he's like uncomfortably pretty like when you see him i'm like how come i wasn't made that way oh <laughs> like, you know so everyone good. in life has their their pluses like and a, minuses he's like a brazilian know? ken doll what do you call him what is it Braz- what do they call ken in brazil i don't know i you know <laughs> i should know more portuguese than i do um it's actually quite sad but i picked up a few words along the way yeah um such as um oh, this, my the brazilian a, listeners are gonna love yeah, this one Sombroncelia. I hope I pronounced that right. Guess what that is? From Brazil? No. It's it's Portuguese. Yeah, I know what it means from Brazil. Is that no, what you know? No, 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 no. What does it mean? Eyebrow. Oh yeah. Sombroncelia. <laughs> Sombroncelia. <laughs> Arbory tree. Bom dia. Good day. Bom dia. No. Bom dia is good day. Bom dia is good morning or good morning. Well, this is uh, um, Tamer and Tarek are going to really yeah, love you trying. Yeah, yeah, totally. I, I can um, <laughs> There's such a bring, me as the, like, bring me as the MC in Brazil, you yeah. know, I, I, one of their Brazil shows. So I know like four words. So I know more Spanish than I do. I was trying. I was trying to learn Brazilian for a little while. It's Portuguese. Oh, yeah. Portuguese. I should know that because I bought this stupid app, right? <laughs> I brought, you know what languages I've tried to learn because of places we go? I tried learning Japanese. I learned a little, but oh. I was trying to learn Japanese. I was like, I can do it. No biggie. For like, the, the Japan trip? It's funny. Sometimes I'll think I'm smart, right? And I'll be like, oh, I can learn that. Like, no big deal, right? Like, I was like on this Rubik's Cube quest to like, like, I go through these stupid quests, right? And I'm like, oh, I'll break the record, whatever. Like, I'm smart enough to do it. <laughs> it's like three days later, I haven't figured this thing out. <laughs> like, I have this, this, like I don't know this like a uh, confidence issue that I think you are smart. I'm, I'm relatively smart, but sometimes oh, I not think relatively. I... You are very smart. <laughs> You're like good at everything. It's crazy things that I don't even like. I'm like, how do you know this? Yeah, I have a lot of little. You have a lot of skills. I have a lot of skills. I would say yeah, a lot of like random Useful things, like a random skills. things. Yes, yeah, yes. random things. But it was funny because I tried learning Jap- Japanese when we went to Japan. And I bought the I bought the thing, and it was like we had like eight weeks, and I was like, oh, I'll learn it. I'll like be like almost fluent in eight weeks. <laughs> and I went there like froze up, like I was like, what did you just say? Like slow down. It doesn't sound like that when the American guy says it in my app. <laughs> it's like, and then I was like, I'll learn Portuguese because there's so many Brazilians in our industry. You know, I should just learn it. Like yeah, that went out like three weeks later. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, you know, I went well. to Brazil once, and it gave me diarrhea for a month. <laughs> I don't know if I'll be back, but. That's- 
Water? I don't know. Yeah. Probably. But my waistline was really small there so for a, a month. That was in 2015. A lot of butt stuff on this podcast lately not related to building muscle. <laughs> just, yeah. Just. You know something? Speaking <laughs> of butts, like the stereotype is not false. Like a Brazilian booty, like, you know, you go into their gyms and, you know, it's not necessarily like a competitor gym and they, they're blessed, man. They're blessed. Yeah. Back there. Good thing they had wellness, man. And they have cute outfits and, like, onesies that are bright, like, my style. You know? <laughs> uh, okay. What? So, what? another reasons for plateaus, right? Going into plateau day. Yeah, plateau day. Plateau day. Okay, so here's one thing that I will run into very often with competitors um, is this – how should I say this? Sometimes when you're in the gym and you're working really hard and you get these competitors that are, like, they have this – pride behind how much they work out yeah and they'll be like i work out three hours a day i work out three hours a day and i like post about it and it's cool i'm glad that you are like really into your workouts i think that's awesome that you're super dedicated um but the problem is, is you can beat yourself up to the point where you will slow down or stop getting results and you can't like your results aren't happening in the gym they're happening out of the gym you're creating a stimulus in the gym. Your results are happening out of the gym. But what people forget to men think about is that you're working more than the muscular system when you're in the gym. Okay, So when you're in the gym, you're working three different systems, your muscular system, your nervous system, and your skeletal system. So it's not just muscle. Muscle can pretty much ha handle anything. I mean, it's very rare that your muscle is going to be like, okay, it's too much. Like it's it's pretty rare. Your muscle can usually just handle it, recover pretty quickly. It's not going to, you know, it's it's generally the 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 last thing to to fail on well i guess second i guess the skeletal system will be second to last or uh, mess will be second to last so but your nervous system it takes a beating you know when you're doing this and that's where things get really get beat up and sometimes you know you doing a lot of working out or you being the people that are like never take a day off and then you're you're stopping getting results because you're addicted to the workout which is great because i'm addicted to the workout too i'm not saying i'm above it at all i i mess up on that all the time like there'll be months where i don't miss a day of working out Whoa. and yeah i just I feel like, you know, I just feel like I feel kind of like sloppy if I don't work out. I don't know. I just feel fatter, even though I might, I might I'm probably not, you know. So, um, you know, so I just I'll go to the gym, even if it's a crappy workout. I've been better about it lately, but it's still something I've I mean, I've, I've struggled with it since I was like a little kid. Actually, you know, what's crazy. Is I want I don't know what the record is, but I'm probably pretty close. <laughs> I worked out every day from when I was 13 till I was 21. I never missed a single day from 13 to 21. Jeez. Yeah, I was just fully addicted to it. Like since I, I was just I remember I remember like I would get anxiety, like extreme anxiety about when like December hit, not because it was Christmas, but because the gym was going to be closed. It was the only day of the year. So I'd like try to figure out a way to come up with a solution where I could work out on Christmas day. <laughs> right. And then what's funny is, uh, late, even later on in life, when I was like 28 or whatever, I found a, a friend who let me into his gym at like at that age. Cause he was like a local guy who had a small gym and he would let me access in his gym on Christmas day. Like I'd still freak out about it. But so I was in my garage lifting my mom's chairs like I'd always make it where it was like a shoulder day because I could make a my mom had these chairs that had these little like grooves in them where you could pull back the chair you know like a little groove so I use those as like shoulder presses and like lateral raises and, like just be in the garage on Christmas day like just lifting chairs <laughs> like totally normal I'm not addicted so <laughs> I was, but there's a lot of people out there who have that have that issue and um, you can work against yourself that way and occasionally you got to do this thing where it's where you do a deload, okay? Where basically you kind of resensitize yourself to exercise again, okay? Because you can't just keep progressing. So bodybuilding is is, you know, I'm gonna I'll go into what bodybuilding, how simple it is, right? So bodybuilding is is simple as this. And if you guys are watch, listening to the podcast, I'm doing something with my hands. So sorry, we have it on YouTube too. But but basically, hands. <laughs> hands. Jazz hands. I need to bring small <laughs> Jazz hands. hands. Was that one Napoleon Dynamite? How's that uh, go? Like There's this? yeah, the bird thing. You wanna hear so okay, before I go into that, the best posing routine I've ever seen in my life. Uh Brittany uh gosh, I gotta put her what's her is it Brittany Bennett? She got married. I remember her last name now. Um she was one of my competitors like uh two thousand gosh. 2012, 13, maybe 14. Anyway, she started putting on a lot of muscle. And I was like, I think you should do women's physique, right? So she was like, okay. It was like five days before the show. I'm like, you should do figure and women's physique. She's like, all right. So she ended up winning the overall in women's physique that day, like learning how to pose like five days earlier. Like it was crazy. It was just a super rush. And she needs a, she needs a song for her music. And she's a super goofy girl. Like, uh, I think it's like coach muscle nugget on Instagram. I think it's what it is. Oh. I got to look, I got to 
hopefully I'm right on that. Um, but she's, she's just a goofy chick. She's super fun. Um, and she's like, Hey, can you, I don't know, have a way to get the song on a CD. Can you burn it for me so I can get it to them for the song? And I was like, yeah, she's like, use the Napoleon dynamite, uh, music song. And I'm just going to do my routine, like the Napoleon dynamite dance. Like when it was like the vote for Pedro or whatever it was like the voting thing of like that, his dance thing. I was like, are you sure? She's like, yeah, I'll make it work. Don't worry. So she did, she like basically did the whole, the Napoleon dynamite dance, like with the hand thing, with the, like the whole thing. And then like ran off the stage, like awkwardly because he runs off and like just posed in between it. And it was still like, everyone's cracking up. Everyone's into it. Best women's physique routine I've ever seen. I mean, I don't think it'd be like, you should do it on like an Olympian stage or anything, but, but it was so funny. I wish I could find that somewhere. Um, you know, I'm going to try to find it and put it on my stories. I'm going to message her. But anyway, that being said, um, <laughs> all right, bodybuilding. Bodybuilding is simple. All right, so um, bodybuilding, you start here. This is your baseline, right? So here's your baseline. You create a stimulus in the gym. So whether that's, you know, working out really hard one day, going five pounds harder than the last time. You know, I always say, you know, do five more pounds than the last time or do one more rep than the last time. Create a stimulus. Work a little bit harder than last time. That's all you got to do. You create a stimulus. And then from there, so you so your baseline, your stimulus in between when your body adapts to that new stimulus is results. Okay. That's how you get those results. Baseline, stimulus, in between, body's adapting, that's the results. Okay. Eventually, you got to keep doing it. You got to keep going. New stimulus, new stimulus, new stimulus, right? Every time you're in the gym. Eventually, you're climbing so many stairs, there's, you're at the top of the staircase. There's, there's no stairs left, right? So what do you do? Well, you got to go down the stairs, right? You keep your muscle, you deload, you just take a nice walk down the stairs. And what does that mean? Well, you got to take a week off of working out, a few days off working out, and basically resensitize yourself to exercise to some capacity. You're not going to resensitize yourself to all all the way down. You can't just walk all the way down the staircase and be like, all right, I'm starting fresh again. I'm going to do three reps and get a result. But you can resensitize yourself. You can let your nervous system recover. You let your body recover, your joints recover. Remember, you're working the skeletal system, the nervous system too. They have to recover and they take longer than the muscular system. So um, that's, that's basically at some point, if you're reaching that plateau, it might be a good idea for you to take a deload if you've worked to that point of extreme progressions. And, and understand though, it does take a while for some people to get there. If you're one of these people who work out really, really hard, then it's going to be more often than not. If you're someone like Ashley, who's worked out for a very long period of time. Like since I left the womb. Yeah. Remember yeah. a hamstring curled out of my mom's, <laughs> yeah, that's right. you know. <laughs> yeah. I, I, that was my first. That was her first set. That was my first, first set. set. She had a, she had a vein. Uh, so, <laughs> so with, uh, with, with that, you know, you're going to have a longer period of time. I've been working out since I was a kid. So for me to have to go to that point, I'm not personally right now, I'm not working out hard enough where I even feel a deload is justified. Like I, because I've been through bodybuilding, like actual bodybuilding for about 10 years. So when I was working out then and what my body's used to is totally different than what I'm doing to it now. You know, I, I wouldn't even be able to handle what I was doing then, you know, so um, so for me, I'm, yeah, it probably doesn't make too much sense to have to, ju to justify a deload longer than a couple days. Cause I'm not working out that hard. If you're a newer competitor and you're working, you go from your first year of working out and you're, you're watching Ashley's workouts and you're like, I'm going to do those. You're probably going to need to deload a lot faster than Ashley would. So it's definitely person dependent and experience dependent. We call it a workout age. So you have your like diet age, which is how many years accumulated you've been dieting, which might have some long-term, um, long-term ramifications to how you're dieting. So if you've always dieted really, really hard, don't expect to diet really, really easy all of a sudden. And then and you get the same results because your body's going to be a little bit more adapted and used to it before. Same thing with working out. If you worked out for 20 years, yeah, don't expect to gain 20 pounds of muscle the next year. Like it's, your body's just gone through that already. You know, you've, you've lost that window, unfortunately. So um, that's what we call your workout age. So that's going to do go, go along with your deloads and all that stuff too. Fascinating stuff. Fascinating stuff. Fascinating stuff. So, yeah, all what you just said. <laughs> Sometimes it's okay to take a little break, and I think mentally, just like you are, people are so reluctant to take a little bit of time off because they feel like they're going to ruin all their gains, but it's not the case. Sometimes you'll find that once they do, like, a deload and give their body a little break, sometimes you'll see, like, a unexpected check-in. Then you're like, whoa, you made some progress this week by basically just taking it easy. And that's kind of like the approach we do sometimes with, like, peak week and stuff too, right? Yeah. It's kind of like a mini deload in a way. We do a lot less uh, activity during peak week, and 
even more calories sometimes, and uh, we get tighter and leaner, and it's it's an incredible thing. So uh, you got to earn it, though, guys. You can't just yeah. be taking that deload and be like, well, oh, you it's know, time for a deload. <laughs> I'm just going to take a deload because uh, my friend's birthday party is coming up, and she's going out. So, you know. I do, I do try to plan the deloads. Um, like what will happen sometimes with my clients, I'll be like, all right, let's, we should do a deload. And then a lot of times they'll reply back and they'll be like, oh, can I wait like three weeks because I have a vacation plan? Yeah. I would love for my vacation to just be my deload. And I'm like, okay, we can wait yeah, three weeks. Yeah, plan deloads are good. That's a cool, that, when it works out like that, it's like perfect. You get yeah. to just fully relax. And and not be, have any guilt. Yeah, yeah. Not have to worry about exercising when you're away. I've actually had, and, and a lot of times I'll have people lose body fat during deloads or more, I think more lose water weight and whatnot from the like inflammation dying down. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of times for some reason, um, I'll get people who are really active on their deloads like when it, when it comes to they're like oh I'm going to Disneyland with my family I'll do it then and I'm like all right and they're getting so many steps and they end up like losing losing weight and yeah. I'm like all right whatever you know but it's it's you're not you're not uh working out extra so you're just being active so no big deal it's not gonna hurt you totally and I wanted to actually backtrack and you said two key things that I have already listed here about uh why aren't you seeing the progress and Sometimes maybe you are progressing, but not necessarily, it, it's not necessarily showing within your weight and check-ins. For example, um, inflammation you just touched upon. So inflammation can happen, like let's say you started this new workout program and you're killing it yeah. and you're working so hard and you know you are, you're getting sore, you're exhausted. But when you check in the next week, your measurements and weight goes up and maybe you feel a little like softer. And that's not necessarily because you didn't make progress. It's just your body's trying to like recover itself from this new stimulus. So sometimes it'll happen. And a lot of people get frustrated because they're like, yeah. how did I work this hard? And I didn't see any progress. In fact, I got worse and I don't get it. Like I didn't cheat, blah, blah, blah. And it's, it's a pretty common thing. And most of the time you'll see that whenever somebody starts like a new plan because they're not used to working out that intensely yeah. or in that certain way. I, I totally agree on that. And especially with new plans, especially mm -hmm. like these like high, high level ones, right. you know, we do. So, um, like your, your shoulder one you did the other day, that would have been a, one of them that would cause that. Oh, the, so much. I did the newbie fat. I'm still sore. My yeah. measurements went up this week. Oh yeah. I already checked in, but yeah, That's I awesome. don't know. Maybe, you know, they're probably still inflamed <laughs> and they're still sore. I can't yeah. believe it. I haven't been we gotta sore do in years. More newbie. Yeah. New fits, I yeah. got to do it on these shoulders, man. Yeah. I, I want to do it. Like, so we have a, time. we have a newbie new fit here and we have two people who do it. So Steve, who has a master's degree in kinesiology. And then Sam, who does them as well, and he's and so now I'm gonna we're gonna Ashley's gonna learn the newbie and get huge glutes like oh, yeah. wide in the doors here type definitely of, type and of. shoulders but my yeah. shoulders <laughs> more than like glutes <laughs> yeah so uh, but people love it yeah just, and then the purpose of the newbie is basically to it's electric it's a electrodes right that are on you you're creating a stimulus and you're trying to recruit muscle fiber and wake up muscle fiber that maybe you haven't been using. Um, and also get a better stimulus from the workouts than muscle fibers that you are using and create uh, basically creates more mo more motor units to contract. That's the whole point of it. Yeah. And so, yeah. And you know what I think is cool about that is like in the workout, you don't have to do as many sets, as many reps and stuff. And you go lighter usually because it's kind of, you know, making the workout more intense itself. But I also think that it's pretty cool that like, how do I explain it? You know, whenever you're lifting and let's say I'm going to use legs as an example or glutes because you can really feel like the burn and you feel like, you know, you know, the feeling when you're really pushing it hard and it like burn and you're like struggling and it hurts. Like, you know, it's where intense workouts aren't supposed to feel good, you know, um, but it's almost like with the newbie, since it's like giving the little pulses, it's like distracting to where you don't realize that your glutes are on fire. It's like a distraction. So it doesn't hurt as much as a it. usual workout if that makes sense yeah it's like a distraction so i kind of like that too but i'm excited <laughs> to try to get so that you can push harder because you're not yeah. feeling it as much okay yeah totally and then um also i wanted to go into a little bit about holding water too so sometimes when you do check in you might have made the progress but for whatever reason you're holding water and maybe that is due to the sleep thing or it could be like maybe like let's say one day you just wanted to drink a jar of pickle juice and <laughs> you're you have a little sodium influx there which isn't bad we don't ever like cut sodium we're not saying sodium's bad but whenever you have um a fluctuation of sodium your body can sometimes hold on to a little bit of water but it's not a big deal you get rid of it in two days people some people get too bent out of shape about like sodium and yeah. having too much it's like unless you have like a medical condition it's not 
Yeah. We're not trying to avoid it. I, I have a lot of sodium. Yeah. I, I do drink pickle juice. I was going to say, way. yeah, Ashley loves pickle juice. With stevia in it. Wait, oh. with stevia, that's new. I like, no, no, no. That's the only way I drink it. Really? I yeah. didn't know you were doing that. It has to be sweet. Ashley has a stevia problem. She is really oh, loves, yeah, yeah. The, her stuff is uh, like she's dealt up a tolerance, I think, to it. So, and it's oh, so yeah. sweet. I like everything really sweet. Yeah. <laughs> even, I, even things that aren't supposed to be sweet, I sweeten it. I sweeten everything. Even if like it's chicken and broccoli, I'll sweeten it. Or pickle juice, I'll sweeten it. Yeah, <laughs> it is. It is. Sweet. That's kind of a weird thing. That's kind of it like is. a. But you do it with salt, though. You'll salt your salad. Yeah, I do. Salt. I will sweeten my salad. You do. Yeah, you use a. She makes her own. This is a good tip, though. A good hack is this. The one I will give you a ton of credit on is that stevia mustard. You make oh, the yeah. honey mustard dressing. Yeah, you with just, just put regular mustard sweetener in a mustard and shake it up in the in the little. Um, what do you call it? Bottle. Yeah. <laughs> Bottle or or whatever. It's like honey mustard. You could do a soy sauce too. Make teriyaki. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. yeah, they have that Stevie Aki stuff. If you're in Denver. It's not the same thickness, but yeah. Yeah, if you're in Denver, there's, a, okay, if you're in Denver or anywhere in Colorado, I think, where else is Tokyo Joe's? I think it might be in California too now or Texas. I hope it comes to Vegas. Yeah, that'd Come be to sweet. Vegas, please. He said it was to the markets too. I talked to, I actually, Saturated. I already asked, him, asked Larry. Yeah, Larry's the owner. He's a, cool, he's a cool guy. He said, yeah, he's like, we already like Teriyaki Boy. They're already, um, Teriyaki Madness and Teriyaki Boy. I like those two. Yeah, they're not. T- Tokyo Joe's blows them out of the water for sure. But they have this stuff called Stevie Aki. And one time he sent me like a, Remember he sent me those like two like gallons of it? He was yeah. like, yeah, I'll send you some. I was thinking he's going to send me like a pint. He sent me like two, it was like a two years worth of Stevie Aki. Oh. But that stuff's like, it's so good. So if, you, if you're if you in Colorado and you need a hack, uh, get some Stevie Aki from Tokyo Joe's. They sell it and it's like, I want to say it's like a bunch of it. I want to say it's like four tablespoons. It's like 40 grams of carbs. It is, it'll change your prep. It is so good. Mm-hmm. So anyway, shout out to, to Larry shout from out, Tokyo Joe's. Out. Anyway, I got another question came in here. And uh, from H.M. Erdman on our on Instagram, he says, does low T hinder weight loss? If they have low T, do you have them get on replacement shots? Okay, so low T definitely will hinder results. Definitely will hinder results. Um, I've had it where I got someone's labs tested. They had low T. They got on T. And then the next thing you know, everything changed and the results started flying by. So one, I will never make those recommendations for someone because one, I need to see their labs on top of it. I do, I do know how to review labs. I talk to people about labs. I talk to our doctors about the labs um, and review them. But the doctors have the right away on that type of thing. So I'll never be like, hey, you should take this. But I do talk to doctors like, this is where they should probably be at. Um, this is what's going on with them. And I kind of do those consults. Um, we use a guy named David. And I'm on the phone with him like every day. So um, talking about labs and whatnot, things like that. So yes, I think that especially in bodybuilding, in a bikini building, that's something that if you're if you're getting great results and you're young and everything's fine, then yeah, you probably don't have any issues at all. But if something's slow and there's a problem, that's usually when I'll say, hey, you know what, let's just check this and let's just check that box and make sure it's not. You know, Ashley had an issue a few years back where her we found out her thyroid was super low. Um, and yeah, that... that um, that j- changed things when she got just to normal levels. Now we're not going past normal levels. We're just getting, you know, basically replacing what the body isn't producing on its own. So yeah, uh, definitely. If, especially if you're like, I'll say anyone past, I started say, I started doing TRT when I was 31, I want to say. And then I was, um, I was really low on test and it totally changes your, your world. It changes your mood, your energy, um, your recovery in the gym. I mean, oh, just a lot. It's really, really helpful. So yeah, if you're in that, if that's a possibility for you, get that checked out. What else we got? So I have a few more reasons, okay? So firstly, you know, sometimes people get a little loosey-goosey with weighing their food, and um, maybe they're not really mm, accurately assessing how many empty calories they're putting in. For example, like, you know, maybe you could be just adding a little calories here and there, maybe putting a little creamer in your coffee, but not really thinking about it, whether it be intentional or unintentional. Sometimes calories go unaccounted for and they eventually add up. And I've, I've heard a few cases as well where like maybe, maybe more so of like a new competitor, but maybe they were drinking like a coffee and that was a coffee that they had all the time. It's what they always order from Starbucks, but they didn't really put two and two together that the coffee had sugar in it and they were just drinking like 500 calories of sugar the whole time. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes that does happen. Although, you know, you should know better. (laughs) Like I said, that's mostly a newbie competitor thing and they're not really realizing like, Oh yeah, I always got this McDonald's iced coffee. You know, I didn't realize they use actually sugar in it. And that's the issue. Sometimes when you do go to like restaurants or order, 
um, coffees is, and I get really paranoid about it sometimes <laughs> when I'm close to a show, like, and, and I'll have like, tested. Adam, can you taste us <laughs> this, this diet Coke? Cause I'm like, that would suck if I drank like this, this Coke that I thought was diet and it was actually full sugar. Like if it doesn't have like a label on it, right. You never know. Sometimes with coffee too, when you add or add the, the sugar free, you know, syrups, Maybe they're not paying attention and they just do the full sugar. Yeah. So that can happen, you know, and condiments too, that can happen. Maybe they, they're a fa fan of ketchup and not really thinking much of it, but putting a lot of ketchup on their food every day. And it's like the regular ketchup perhaps. And, you know, like I mentioned, those little calories, they eventually add up. They do. So although it might not seem like a big deal at the moment, they add up and they can hinder your progress. And oftentimes whenever they make the discovery, like, oh, well, maybe I should just, you know, eliminate that. Then they can start seeing more results. So, yeah. you know, the closer you get to a show, the stricter you should be with that kind of stuff. Yeah, and the sneaky calories tend to be, like, the worst ones, too. Because yeah. it's, like, sneaky creams and, in, 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 in like, uh, in coffees. It's sneaky sugars. It's, it's never, like, oh, I just... Sneaky protein. Like remember you know, when like, we went to, to Tokyo, Japan, and you oh, were I got you were like, I on. loved you're like, I love <laughs> this coffee. So disappointing. <laughs> Cause they do the calorie um It was all in Japanese. Yeah. Yeah, it was, it was funny. So okay, I'll go over the story. They had these like they were like a dot I don't know what the conversion was. It was like a what do they call it over there? It was a yen. I can't even yen. remember. Yeah, uh Japanese yen. Yen. So I don't we know. Were, I know Chinese it was like a, is yen, but it was like a dollar yen or whatever. So it was like super cheap. If I'm doing my math right again, I totally forget. Anyway, it was like super cheap, these little glass bottles. And I was like, this coffee is great. It's only got 10 calories. It was like 10 calories or 15 calories. I think it was calories. like 45 actually. And was it? I, I don't know. I don't know. It was, you know, it was more than, it had to be yeah, more than 10. Because it was, because, it was, 10, because when you did the math, you're like, hey, you know, these have. So I was thinking like it had 40, whatever, 40 calories in the whole thing for 45. And I was like, oh, it's just, that's right. It was like 45. And I was like, it's just milk and milk and coffee. It's really good. And then uh, like Ashley looked at it. It was all in Japanese. So I didn't know. She's like, you know, there's like five servings per thing. Right? I was drinking like three of them a day. Oh. I was like, oh my gosh, I'm drinking like 800 calories or whatever from. Just a waste from, of calories. Yeah. So it happens. You yeah. Know? I mean, at least she had a good excuse. It was in a different language, right? Yeah. What Which if I knew the whole time and I was just uh, like. <laughs> I was but like, yeah, I mean, <laughs> it, it, that happens. And um I think mostly it happens when there isn't a label, but yeah. you know, if the label's a different language. Well, in, a, you know. in America, something that size would be one serving, yeah. right? Yeah. Well, over there, it was all in grams. It was yeah, like, they do the grams. Yeah, they it was do, like, like you have to do math. Yeah, it was like 500 grams in the bottle, but it was 100 grams per serving, and then it was all in Japanese, so I didn't know. And I was like, and then Ashley like showed it, and I was like, how did you even read that? But thank you. And I then think I was, like even if I if I'm correct even like canada does the grams and then you have to do the math oh yeah i'm i'm i could be wrong we but do. i think we're the only people that don't do it like that it gives us like the like you we're used to certain things you know what's funny is that all the labels i've seen in different countries because i get a lot of labels from different countries from clients sending them to me I will say that ours are the easiest to read, but we're the fattest people. Why is that? Or maybe <laughs> you know, it's like, the easiest to read because we're not used to anybody else's method. Maybe. Just like, you know, same thing with weight, like when we, uh, pounds and stone or st uh, kilogram. kilogram, kilogram sorry. stone. There's stone is a thing too. Stone's yeah. really hard. Stone's really, I have a, I have a stone client. That's a hard one. Stone, <laughs> stone client. She's rock hard. Oh, da, da. <laughs> she doesn't complain much though. That's huh? my, that's my thing. So, so the, uh, yeah, no st stone is like, there's like barely any stone for pound. It's like, or it, it's like, Barely, like someone will be like seven stone. It's like like oh, their whole weight. Like it's it's tiny. So um, yeah, but no, the labels are a lot harder in different countries from what I'm used to. It's all there's a lot of math involved. Yeah. Ours are like that's how many calories you are, and then our our American people are like, well, it doesn't matter. I'm eating it anyway, <laughs> like yeah. regardless of yeah. it, you know. So what else we got on there, Ashley? Why aren't we getting results? So I find that a lot of times the caloric output is uh, they they overestimate their caloric output, right? So I. I think this is most common in the winter time when people aren't moving around as much, but something is to be said, to, you know, getting in your knee, right? So in the summertime, mm -hmm. we're walking around more um, versus the winter time when we park like two feet from the store door because mm -hmm. we don't want to get cold and walk outside and it gets dark at 5 p.m. So, you know, this also happens when people switch jobs, right? Maybe they were at a job where they were on their feet all day, like as a waitress, like for a long, long time. And then they maybe quit that job or something else. And they're not getting that same 
activity as they usually would. And they might be wondering like, well, I'm eating the same. I'm doing all the cardio should be doing, but why is this not, why, why am I having this difficult time losing weight? Well, maybe they're just not moving around as much and getting in that neat that they used to be getting in. I will say that's, yeah, that's for sure a thing. When I was, when I was personal training, like more, I used to do but how I used to do it was I would personal train Monday through Wednesday and then Thursday and Friday I do all my check-ins, but now I just do check-ins only. Um, it's much harder for me to stay lean than it was then. Like I'm eating less calories now and having a harder time staying lean than I was then. You know, I had to have more diet weeks and things like that now. Back then it was just like I'd stay lean pretty much all the time, which is moving all the time, you know, yeah. lifting weights for people, putting them back. Like you're just always busy, you know, and I was a pretty busy trainer too. I was doing like 10 sessions a day. So uh, yeah, it's, it's definitely different being on your feet. And, uh, and doing that. That's one day when I retire, I'm going to, I'm going to personal train again. I, I, I do miss it. I do. I think it's fun. It was a fun time. Yeah. <laughs> one of these days. with the days. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it probably take, it probably take me like a month to get used to the, to be able to be at that volume again. and like actually be on my feet and carrying around weights. I bet uh-huh. you I'd be like super tired. Yeah. yeah. Cause I was a machine back then. It was funny. You just, you're just lifting weights all day long. You're just grabbing weights, 45s. And my clients, you know, a lot of my clients never left. They'd just be with me like for a decade. They just wouldn't leave. And so they would be, it was great. We're like best friends. And then you're just grabbing weights are getting stronger and stronger. And I'm like, damn, Karen, these like hundred pound dumbbells. For them. Like you're just carrying weights all the time. Right. That was, that was a, you burn a lot of calories, man. That was a good, that was a fun, I will say that personal training um, was probably like, I mean, this job's pretty fun, but and that job is pretty fun. I mean, that is a pretty fun life, you know, being a personal trainer, especially because like the gym camaraderie with the other trainers and things like that too. Mm-hmm. But anyway. Yeah. And also like, as far as like the caloric output being overestimated, it can also happen if they're doing cardio and they see like maybe the number on the elliptical gives them oh, like yeah. a number, but that's not necessarily catered to you. Right. Yeah. So maybe you, maybe the treadmill says you burnt 500 calories, but that's like your average, like American or something like that, or somebody that weighs more. That doesn't mean that's what you're going to burn, especially if you've been doing cardio for a long time and you're kind of adapted to it. You know, that's, that number can be deceiving as well as when maybe they're um, holding on to the step mill when they're stepping and yeah taking the the weight off of their legs and kind of propping themselves up and then they see this number being burned on the on the cardio equipment and they're like whoa I burned 500 calories but in reality maybe it was only 100 because they were you know kind of cheating a little bit or just maybe the the inaccuracy of the uh, caloric burn doesn't apply to like their physique you yeah know? and that because that's going to go into another topic which is cardio in general too and like your training heart rate, and whatnot. And that's a question I get all the time. Um, so two things first off on that. Well, there's two things I forgot to touch on. <clears throat> One is going to be the, how we talked about those little secret calories. I didn't forgot to mention if you're a bikini competitor and you're, let's say 110 pound bikini competitor, you might be down as low as 1100, 1200 calories getting ready for a show. You know, it's really easy to add 20% of those calories to that low caloric intake. So if you're doing a lot of sauces and a lot of different things like that and you just don't pay attention, you might add 20% calories very easily because it's not hard to get an extra 100 calories from sauces. I mean, you could do 40, 50 calories per meal and you're like, oh, it's just a little bit of barbecue sauce. Oh, it's a little bit of sugar-free this, a little sugar-free that. And you're like, times it by five meals and you're doing, you know, 40 calories, 45 calories per meal. You're talking 220 calories or so at the end of the day from you know, not ideal sources. You're not adding 220 calories from proteins, you know? Right, so they're empty calories. Yeah. So like, just be, pay attention. That's one of the reasons. And you know, some of these people really sauce their stuff up too. You might be in the, you know, might be eating 400 calories or so. And it looks like it's not much. And it might be one of those coffees and it might be one of these things. And it might be a nibble on that. And the next thing you know, you know, you're at 400 calories. And then right. when, when we talk about cardio, um, what you're talking about. So if someone's exhausted, okay. So let's say you're in week one of a 16 week prep. And you're kicking butt on cardio. You're like, I'm going to kill this prep. And you have all this stored energy still. And you have a lot of body fat to lose. You have all your glycogen still full. Like you went through a pre-prep plan. So I I usually try to like go through a pre-prep diet for people if I have enough time. And I'll basically, the, my pre-prep meal plans are like a month, two weeks before they start their actual prep. And I kind of reduce their cardio as low as I can. I get their calories up, kind of just pre-prep them, right? Get them, get their metabolism spiked, let them go through that regression, let them, that deload per se with the cardio and with the diet. And then, you know, Hey, at 16 weeks, we're going to, we're going to jump right in, right? That type of thing. So I like doing a pre-prep setup, but anyway, so when you're in that state on week one, yeah, you're doing cardio and you're like trucking on the stair mill and your hands aren't touching it, 
But it's a big difference on when you're six weeks out and you're, the grind started and you're having to lose that hard body fat now. And now all of a sudden you're holding on and you're reducing 30% of your weight on the handles and you don't realize you're doing it. You're leaning over and your intensity is down because two things are happening there. Okay. So one, one, you're, you're doing less weight per step, right? You're lifting less load per step when you're lightening the load by holding on. So you're naturally going to burn less calories Two, You weigh less. So you're going to burn less calories on top of that because you've been dieting for 10 weeks or whatever at that stage. So you have those two factors going on, right? But you have one other factor going on that we don't talk about because people don't really realize that it happens, but you're getting more, you're more cardio conditioned at that point. So for example, and that's why I like hit cardio because hit cardio is self progressive, right? So steady state cardio isn't really that progressive on its own, right? You have to progress your, you have to progress it in some capacity. So you have to progress the intensity of it. You have to, you have to uh, progress the time of it, um, the frequency of it. You have to, you have to progress it on its own, like with something external, not within it itself for the most part, besides intensity. So when you look at hit cardio, let's say, just to give you some easy numbers, let's say you're doing 10 minutes of hit cardio and that's all your cardio in week one. Well, for me on week one, 10 minutes of hit cardio, I'm going to burst for like 20 seconds right now, 30 seconds. I'm going to be completely exhausted if I burst the way I'm supposed to burst. And my recovery is going to take me like 90 seconds at this stage where I'm at right now. Right. But week 16, I'm going to be able to invert that. I'm going to be able to burst for like 90 seconds and recover for 30 seconds and be able to go again because I'm more cardio conditioned. So within that 10 minutes itself, even though the 10 minutes hasn't changed, the workout has changed significantly because now I'm bursting for, you know, triple the time and I'm recovering for one, one third the time, right? I'm not gonna be able to burst for 90 seconds, even if I'm really conditioned, if I'm doing it right. But it's just an example, just to make it easy. So, um, that's why I like to hit cardio because it's self progressive, right? But when you look at steady state cardio, it's the opposite. Okay. So when you first start doing steady state cardio and you haven't done cardio intensely for a long time, well, your heart rate, let's say it goes up to 150, just to keep it simple. Well, if you continue at that same pace, you're like, oh, I'm at level eight on the stairs, level 10 on the stairs. If you continue at that same, same pace, that 150 heart rate, which in week one was initially, you know, pretty taxing on your body is now at 130. So you've actually regressed your intensity, not on purpose, but your body has gotten more cardio conditioned. So it's now easier for you to do the same motions that you were doing on week one. So it's actually naturally de like regressive, right? On how you're doing your cardio. So you need to keep up with that. And that's why you're generally adding more time to it. So if you're doing all three things, yeah, it can slow down. If you're, if you're, um, you know, you weigh less, right? Because you're down 15 pounds in your prep. Now you weigh less. Now you're holding on because you're tired. Now your heart rates is, is lower when you're doing the same cardio that you were doing before. Yes, of course, you're going to have to increase your cardio when you're doing that. But if you're able to maintain on the progression and you're able to maintain and get your heart rate, keep your heart rate up at 150, keep your intensity going, um, progress your intensity, not hold on to the handle. So you probably don't need to do that much more cardio at the end of prep because you're still maintaining a stimulus of some type, right? So those, that's going to be another reason why you're maybe not getting the results at the end because you're not maintaining that, keeping up on that thing that, you know, no one really talks about or thinks about that logically. So, um, now one thing I will say, cause I'm going to get a hundred questions. What heart rate should I be at? That's what I always get like from clients. Okay. I don't really care what heart rate you should be at. I don't really care like what your heart rate is. Obviously if it's healthy, there's this method called the Carvonin uh, formula, which is basically uh, 220 minus your age times an intensity. So um, for me, for example, I'd be 220 minus 20 years old because I'm y young and 20. And <laughs> so it'd be like 200 would be like my max heart rate. These are simple numbers. And then you'd be at like 85% of that for like a high intensity. So 85 uh, times two would be 170 would be like my intensity if I was 20 years old based on Carvonin, right? But there's a lot of factors that go into that. You know, it's going to be easier for me to get to 170 right now because I'm not cardio conditioned, right? Um, if later on, if I'm a marathon runner for a hobby, getting that person to 170, good luck. You're not going to, it's going to be, you're going to have to have them running from a bear to get them at 170. So, um, so it's going to be different for different people. So that's why I don't, I say, I don't even really worry about the heart rate. I just want you to be working at an intensity level that is intense to you. Um, generally at that level, that's past walking, but before jogging. So like that, that awkward speed where it's like you're moving, but you're not jogging type of thing. And that's kind of where I like to keep people at. And then, um, I don't really focus so much on the heart rate. There's this thing called rate of perceived exertion, RPE, which is basically, um, you know, how, how you're, how much you're exerting. So, I mean, in a, in a simple way of describing it, if you're not able to talk at all, when you're doing cardio, you're at like a hundred percent exertion 
right? So you shouldn't, you know, that's going to be hard to maintain. If you're able to carry a full conversation, you could probably go harder than that. So it's kind of that awkward stage where you kind of can't really talk fully, but you can still talk, but you wouldn't have like a conversation. So yeah, so that's kind of RPE. So that's what I'll kind of use more than heart rates. I don't really like heart rate because of that that factor. So heck yeah, heck there you yeah. go. That was a long one, huh? Oh yeah. So um, but I just uh, so we have just a few more uh, bullet points on here to discuss very quickly because. I got an eye appointment, you know, <laughs> um, but um, I think this is the last one since it's already. Oh, yeah. OK. So um, I just wanted to add on to that. You can also adapt to calorie amount. So just because you were uh, steadily losing a weight at 1800 calories through your whole prep doesn't mean it's always going to stay that way. There's going to come a time where you have to lower it in order to make progress. So yeah. that's one thing. And then also just one thing to mention, I, I think this definitely goes uh very well into what we're talking about. I know you and Tori made a video about weighing your food and how a lot of people inaccurately weigh their protein, even though protein's the best of the macros as far as not putting on uh, excess weight, it still happens. And things like that can definitely affect your overall calorie amount throughout the day. So maybe it would be helpful for you to describe a little bit about that video and just maybe even if you guys can remember to put that link in the description yeah. so they can watch the video on accurately weighing their um, yeah, um, meat. We'll, we'll do that. Um, we'll put the link in the description. Arthur, we could do that. Yep. All right. Um, so with the, with the, the, what she's talking about measuring food, we did this video on food measuring and, and specifically protein measuring, cooking it through five different methods and how much, the, how many calories the food actually has. So most people are measuring their food cooked, right? Um, almost everyone measures their food cooked. So if you had five ounces of protein, um, I'll say four ounces of protein cooked, I think in that video was close to five and a half ounces. So you're having one and a half ounces extra of raw. Now the, the calories that you're looking at are raw calories. So it's, so when you cook it and it shrinks up and you're eating four ounces, you're actually eating five and a half. So now you're doing one and a half ounces extra and you times that by, let's say five meals extra, you know, we're talking an extra, what is that? Eight ounces, seven and a half ounces, something like that. So it's a, it's a significant amount of calories at the end of the day. So those are some things to consider too. And you're, you're getting more protein. If you're going to mess up on one macro, that's definitely the one right. to do it. <laughs> but it's, um, it, but at the end of the day, now you're eating, you know, 1700 calories versus eating 1500. And it does make a big difference there, you know? So, um, yeah. And it's in, in some of those people who are measuring their food wrong and they'll be like, Oh, I had to go down to 900 calories. And I'm like, ah, you're actually at like 1300. So not that bad for a prep, you know? Right. <laughs> and if you're thinking 1300 calories is bad for a prep and you're a bikini competitor, you're not living in the real world. Yeah. <laughs> so I do have to say that out loud because a lot of these girls are like, I can't believe I had to go down so low. I'm at 1700 calories. And I'm like, <laughs> you, you're not living in reality here. Yeah. You know, I was, I always refer them to Chris Bumstead's video. Chris Bumstead is a giant human, three time Classic physique, Mr. Olympia. And um, there was a video he had where he had to get under, he, had to, he was eating 1,550 calories, I think it was, and doing two hours of cardio a day. And the calories were like purely, strictly clean calories, right? Like, you know, for him, that's nothing, you know? That is a tiny amount of calories. But he's like, whatever, I'm just going to do it, you know? Um, I, always I always mentioned Russ, he's my friend, I know a lot about stuff. I remember there was a time he had to be under 1,000. He's a 230-pound bodybuilder. You know, and he's like, yeah, to make classic, I just did it, but it's fine. You know, I just had to suffer to get there. And I'm like, he's like, but when I'm suffering, I feel like it's working. Right. And I'm like, <laughs> I don't like, and then I have a bikini competitor. She's like, I'm 120 pounds and I'm 1700 calories and I'm starving. <laughs> You're killing me. And I'm like, don't. If it were easy, okay. everyone would do Gosh, it, right? It's going to be uncomfortable. You're not it's supposed be to be this lean and this muscular. Right. You're not supposed to be this lean. Your body will fight you on it. You know, if you're going to do this sport, you have to face a little bit of that reality. And yeah, you're going to have to get uncomfortable 90% of you, some of you know, and it's all relative comfortability, right? So, you know, I could mention the Louise is like the famous one I mentioned here because her calories are so crazy high, you know, for her, yeah, her getting under, you know, her eating 1800 calories is a little bit hard for her, but she doesn't complain ever, but it is low to her eating 4,000 calories. Right. <laughs> but when someone's starting off at 2,500 and they're complaining about 17, I'm like, Hey, like I dieted at like 1500 when I was getting ready for shows. So anyway, with that, guys, I think uh, I think that is it. That was a fun. I think we did a good job. Heck yeah, we did. That's I what's think, up. I think we did a good job that one. You Coco? did. You did great. Good yeah. job, Ashley. Yeah, good job, Adam. You Woo. know that was a good one. So uh, you guys keep those questions coming in. We always got them. Thank you very much for the lovely Ashley. <laughs> and we'll talk to you guys next week. <laughs>